Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. Today we're continuing on with Unit 2, our discussion on population and specifically now we're talking about uh, population movement. Uh, today we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. Uh, up to this point we've been talking about international migration, movement between countries. Uh, and Today we're going to be talking a little bit more about internal migration, uh, specifically looking at the United States and some of the trends that we've seen in the United States. Uh, if you're over really the last maybe 10 to 20 years uh, and some new things that have been happening. Uh, so when we talk about internal migration, we're talking about movement that happens within a country. And of course, this, thing, this can happen for any number of reasons. Uh, as we know, and we talked about push factors and pull factors, people are always, when people move, this is something, they're going to be compelled by something. Uh, movement, moving, as you probably have experienced in your lifetime, is not something that people take uh, and they do lightly and there's a lot of planning there's a lot of things that go into moving and so when we talk about even this internal movement within a country uh, this is going to be something that uh, is driven by specific factors uh, especially if you look within a country a lot of it's going to be uh, driven by economic factors people looking for new jobs people looking for new opportunities uh, things along those lines so when we talk about internal migration, uh, there are two main types that we refer to. We have what's called intra-regional and we have intra-regional. Inter-regional is a movement that happens uh, between regions. And again, depending on what country you're talking about, uh, there are going to be different regions that are represented. In the United States, we can talk mainly about the, uh, we'll talk about the, the north. We can talk about the Midwest. We can talk about the south. And we can talk about the west. Uh, intra-regional is going to be movement that happens within a region uh, and you know in the, these particular regions we talk about intra-regional maybe we could uh, get even uh, a little bit more specific with our scale that we're looking at and we look, can look at um, or we can look at something like uh, urban to suburban movement counter-urbanization things along those lines so again inter inter-regional that's movement between regions intra-regional is movement within a region. Well, when we look at intra-regional migration movement within a region, uh, really one of the initial factors that's going to cause people to move within the region is going to be industry. We see we've kind of we've seen this historically, uh, especially places where uh, you maybe didn't have large cities before, and you had a lot of people employed in the agricultural sector. So when you have these industries begin to crop up, uh, people a lot of times are going to start moving into uh, the cities for jobs. And so remember, the initial movement is going to be from rural to urban. One of the things we might forget is that initially you do not have suburban spaces. Really, you only had two uh, two places. You had the urban center, you had the urban area, the urbanized area, and you had the rural area that existed outside of it. And so uh, when you look at this intra-regional movement, it's going to be industry is going to be one of these main driving forces that is going to cause people to begin this intra-regional movement. And then over time, what may happen and what has happened in the United States and other parts of the world uh, but mainly in the United States is where we've seen it, is people begin moving from an urban setting into a suburban setting so that people can uh, move to a place that is, is still convenient to their urban area, still has a lot of the attractions of the urban area, easy to access the urban area, uh, but it's a little less dense. There's less people living out in those particular areas. And so uh, these are some of the very first uh, initial elements of inter-regional movement that we begin to see. Again, so what begins to happen is uh, you have the initial move of people from rural areas to urban areas, mainly looking for jobs. And I like to draw a little diagram typically to kind of illustrate this point and maybe not be very well drawn because of uh, the fact that I'm using a computer here. But anyway, uh, so you have the urban center uh, where the factories and things are and then you have kind of the surrounding rural areas. So initially you have kind of these poor farmers uh, people who are looking for jobs. So I'll, I'll draw my poor farmer here with his hat, straw hanging out of his mouth. Okay, he's moving with his family. You know, he's just looking for a job, uh, and so he's going to move into the urban area. 
Now what begins to happen is, is this the urban setting becomes very crowded. A lot of it's being crowded with, with typically poor people looking for factory work. And of course, you know, they're not going to be living in the most pleasant of conditions. Uh, they're not going to be able to afford a whole lot of things. And, and of course, when you have tend to have high rates of poverty in a, in a given area, crime and things like that begin to rise. And so you, the types of people that were living in the cities initially, you had a lot of wealthy people because those were the factory owners, those were the businessmen, the bankers who were there to be close to, uh, who were there to be close to their businesses and things like that. And so when it becomes really crowded and there's a lot of poor people in the area, uh, you know, wealthy people tend to not like to live next to poor people. So you have the wealthy uh, who begin to move out to this area, kind of right outside of the city. So I like to draw my my wealthy guy who looks maybe like Mr. Peanut a little bit. He's got the top hat. And he has his he has his monocle. I like to draw his monocle. It's right here. So he's Mr. Wealthy. He's sitting out here. You know, a lot of times I try to draw a cigar, but that's gonna be really hard with my my computer here. But anyway, so so wealthy guy uh, moves out of the city. He doesn't want to be near the poor people. He's wealthy, has a lot of money. He doesn't want to be near the urban poverty and kind of the things that are uh, are associated with urban poverty and think and and kind of the filth and the dirt. Of the factory, so he begins to move out to these outer reaches of the city, but that are still close enough. That are still close enough in order to uh, get to the city on a regular basis. Whether he wants to check on his his factory, uh, maybe he's a banker, so he wants to go check on his investments or be a part of the you know be in the branch or the the bank where he's lending money on a regular basis. So of course he's going to have to be able to afford a mode of transportation to get in the city. He might even have a house in the country. Or the, what eventually becomes a suburban area, or he might even have, uh, and he might also have a house in the city so that he could live in the city for the week, go out to the country on the weekends. And so this is eventually the area that becomes the suburbs. And again, not terribly well drawn, I apologize. So you have the suburbs right here urban area, suburbs, and then kind of these rural area. Uh, so with the crowded stream, crowded cities, what eventually is created this counter stream. And again, a lot of it's your, your wealthier people that begin to move out and over time your middle class folks are going to begin to move out also uh, because they now have enough money they can move out to the suburban areas they want to raise their families in the suburban areas things along those lines and so this is and then eventually what we begin to see is this uh, trend was called counter urbanization where we begin pe actually seeing people moving from not just the urban areas but also suburban areas back out to the rural spaces so they can have more space so that they can uh, enjoy this country living, get away from the crowds and things along those lines. Uh, and of course, again, they're going to have to be people who uh, either don't need to be in the city or they are people who can have access to the city on a regular basis because of their personal transportation. A lot of this in the United States was helped by the development of the international highway system. So these international, these, these large highways allow people to move relatively quickly uh, into large urban settings. And now even today, uh, we're getting, we're actually getting movement of people from the suburban or the rural areas back into the cities. There's a renewal place in the cities. Um, back in these places, called, and we're starting to see what's called gentrification occur, and that's kind of another hot button issue that we're not gonna deal with right now, we'll deal with a little bit later in the year. And again, so this just kind of reiterates what I was saying earlier. This counter urbanization is created because new methods of transportation. Initially, it was some of your, uh, maybe your your trains and uh, your short train rides that would take you out in the suburban and the rural areas. New technology that's available, not just in transportation technology, but also in uh, communication technology, information technology that allows maybe mom and dad to work from home. Some of your parents might uh, telework. They might be able to do some of their jobs from the house, so they don't necessarily have to be uh, in the urban center. And also different types of jobs that become available, not just in the city, but also in the suburban areas where people don't necessarily have to go into the urban areas in order to get good good paying jobs so they can support their families. Within the United States what we have begun to see is we be, we've begun to see this general trend happen in the United States uh, and the general trend has primarily been that people are moving from the north to the south and they're also moving from the west and when it says westward uh, people from the north kind of moving southward and westward but we've also people move, seen people move from the extreme west to kind of the south and southwest, uh, mainly from places like California to Arizona, Texas, New Mexico. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with uh, some of the changes that have taken place in the United States. 
Uh, a lot of it has to do with these baby boomers who are now starting to retire, uh, and they want to get away from the harsh weather of the north. They've spent a lot of their time in the north. They've spent their time in factories and, and done very well for themselves or you know, done their work up in the north. And so now they want to move to the south where the weather is better. There's not as much cold weather. Uh, it's, it's warmer uh, most of the year. Uh, they also they move to some of the uh, maybe reti retirement areas uh, in Florida, things like that. I apologize for just drawing on the screen. Um, and apparently I'm not allowed to erase it either, so we'll just have to deal with it. Uh, so they move to the south, they, they have better weather, but there are also other things that have begun to happen uh, in the south. We've, uh, we've seen improved racial tensions, and so a lot of people maybe who are a little bit uh, nervous about the south and the south's... Um, attitude towards outsiders have begun to uh, uh, people are not as worried about that as much and so they feel they feel like the south has gotten friendlier so they move down but also what we've seen is we've seen the movement of a lot of jobs to the south uh, even some of the factory jobs and a lot of that has to do with the taxes of the south it tends to have lower taxes um, less government involvement you also uh, have a tendency to have fewer fewer unions so in order to uh, lower labor costs and lower uh, production costs companies will come to the south so this is creating a lot of jobs in the south which uh, not only obviously doesn't pull the baby boomers but is going to pull a whole new generation of of workers and middle class individuals to the south uh, which kind of has uh, has started to um, make this trend happen where uh, people are people are moving out of the north and to the south and relocating to the south uh, which has caused the south really to rise South and Southwest kind of rise as uh, places of new importance within the United States. So we can see here on these charts, again, you see uh, some of these large movements from, especially here from the Northeast and to the South. Um, again, people moving kind of out to the to the West. Um, again, it's really out of California and into uh, kind of the West and Southwest. Uh, that's beginning to happen now. Uh, here recently we haven't had as much of movement uh, mainly because of the recession and the difficulties uh, in movement that has caused a lot of that was caused by the housing market people couldn't sell their homes so they were having a difficult time kind of getting up and moving and finding new opportunities in other parts of the country and again this is just another diagram to illustrate what I was mentioning earlier this whole idea of of urban uh, to suburban and then to uh, to rural movement so you see this large arrow right here indicates the large number of people who are moving from urban areas into the suburban area but even still we have people moving from suburban areas back to urban and then there's this trend from the urban areas all the way out to uh, the rural areas uh, and so there's kind of this constant movement as we talked about anytime you have a movement of people there's always going to be a counter stream against that for one reason or another and so that's it for today next time we come back we'll be talking about migration models and theories as to why people move and where they might move.